Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing to you Dr. Tanya Dorf. Dr. Dorf will bring to you new information on unique techniques with, for dealing with prostate cancer issues. She will present the outcomes of a clinical trial using herbal, herbal materials for prostate cancer therapy. This data was enthusiastically greeted at the American Society of Clinical Oncology in February of this year. Dr. Dorf will talk about her work using fasting to reduce chemotherapy tox toxicity. She will also present some new prostate cancer ideas, which are just on the horizon. Her interests are both in molecular studies to advance cancer therapy effectiveness and a combination of herbal supplements to treat recurrent prostate cancer with rising PSA. <clears throat> Dr. Dorf received her Doctor of Medicine at UCLA School of Medicine in the year 2000. Her specialties and board certifications are in oncology and internal medicine. Her areas of treatment are bladder cancer, testes cancer, kidney cancer, and of course, prostate cancer. Following a residency at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City, Dr. Dorf came to LAC and USC Medical Center on a hematology and medical oncology fellowship. She currently teaches in the Division of Cancer Medicine and Blood Diseases at the Keck School of Medicine at USC. In addition to being a devoted clinician and researcher, Dr. Dorf has authored numerous published articles and serves as a reviewer for many journals concerning cancer and the current cancer drug targets. She has been either the principal or co-investigator on a dozen clinical trials, including testosterone replacement therapy for prostate cancer survivors. She has lectured on the topic of prostate cancer both in English and in Spanish. She also speaks Lithuanian. Does anybody out there speak Lithuanian? Does anybody out there speak Spanish? Does anybody, how about English? Well, I guess, Dr. Dorf, you're going to have to speak some sign language because some of our audience did not respond to any of your languages. It is with great pleasure tonight that the Prostate Forum of Orange County presents to you Dr. Tanya Dorf. Thank you for that very nice introduction. Um, I will try to project, but if you're having trouble hearing, maybe also you could move closer. Um, I have to apologize to Russ. I think after we spoke, I must have changed my talk just a little bit, so I forgot to put in the fasting information, but I can definitely talk on it without specific slides. I can uh, get you up to speed where we are with that research, which I think is really exciting. And then I did put in the testosterone stuff. I must have misremembered. Uh, but some of you might find the testosterone stuff interesting. If not, I can kind of gloss through that. Can I interrupt? Can you hear in the back? Yeah. Please, if you can't, please move forward because we've got plenty of seats up here. And if you, if you have any trouble hearing, don't hesitate to move forward. <laughs> some brave souls. Well, he was flying those American Airlines jets so long that his hearing's gone. <laughs> <laughs> so I was actually going to start out with testosterone. Um, both as a treatment and more, uh, more commonly as a treatment for survivors who have been left with hypogonadism after the other prostate cancer therapies. Then I'll talk about my herbal therapy trial as Russ alluded to. And then uh, there was some interest expressed in just going over some of the new therapies. Uh, at any point, if it's something you've heard before and you want me to move on to the next thing, um, shout out or raise your hand and I also am fine with taking questions interspersed during the presentation uh, in case you don't want to wait till the end. So testosterone we know is very important to prostate cancer but exactly how it is involved is believe it or not 
not totally clear. Uh, we know that removing testosterone once you've been diagnosed with prostate cancer is an extremely effective therapy. But the converse, that giving testosterone might induce prostate cancer, is not known to be true. In fact, if anything, prostate cancer tends to emerge later in life when testosterone levels are on the decline. This is from a New England Journal paper that reviewed many studies of normal men, no prostate cancer, who were hypogonadal and received testosterone therapy. And this shows the safety. This shows that there was not an excess of new prostate cancers detected compared to men who did not receive testosterone. And Leonard Marks up at UCLA did a very interesting study where he took hypogonad men without prostate cancer. They all had a baseline biopsy, and if they had prostate cancer, they were excluded. And then gave testosterone replacement or placebo. And then he looked at, not only did they develop prostate cancer, but some very interesting tissue and blood studies. So what he found was that although you could raise the blood level of testosterone, you didn't necessarily change what was happening in the prostate gland. So these graphs show, first of all, that in the blood, you raise testosterone, whereas the placebo patients didn't have more testosterone. With testosterone replacement, also you get more DHT, the dihydrotestosterone, or the more potent form. But in the tissue, you see there's no difference whether you got testosterone or placebo. And same with DHT. Uh, here we're looking at gene changes. So we know testosterone can only activate prostate cancer by affecting which genes are being expressed in the prostate cancer cells. <laughs> and here they found that there were no significant gene expression changes whether you got testosterone or placebo. So it's possible that giving exogenous testosterone doesn't affect the prostate as much as one might initially think. He looked at some specific cancer-related genes, such as prostate acid phosphatase and VEGF, the vascular endothelial growth factor, and those were not changed. So there are two ways we could use testosterone in prostate cancer. One would be as a treatment for active disease, but the other, probably more promising approach, is to use it for men who have survived their surgery, their radiation, their hormone therapy, and are left hypogonadal. So the classic papers that inform us about using testosterone in prostate cancer. Oh. I know. All right, I'll step up here. I just feel like it's too close to the screen. It's a little uncomfortable. Um, the classic series that most people refer to uh, include Huggins and Hodges, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering that removal of testosterone could kill prostate cancer cells. Uh, and they found that giving testosterone did make cancer that was there worse. And then the Fowler and Whitmore paper, which is also very famous, where they gave testosterone to men with metastatic prostate cancer, and largely they claimed that there was a poor response, but this was very subjective. They didn't have PSA, they didn't do scans. It was just how the doctor perceived that the man was doing. But even in that paper, there was a subgroup of men who did very, very well, and that remained unexplained. So this is from a paper I published together with Nick Vogelzang, who's out in Nevada, summarizing the current series, the modern data about using testosterone in prostate cancer survivors. So there have been several studies for men who have been treated with seed implants, brachytherapy, external beam radiation, or prostatectomy. And then I think you've heard Bob Leibowitz speak before. Bob and I put together a paper of, of a mixed population who have been treated with testosterone replacement. And what we found uh, by looking through all these studies is that there was a fairly large number of men who could receive testosterone even though they were prostate cancer survivors and could do well. They didn't have progression of their disease. When we look at uh, one of the papers in particular, you will see that it is mostly low-risk prostate cancer patients that are being treated because we're still very cautious. We're all very nervous about giving testosterone when we see the word prostate cancer in someone's history. So these guys, for instance, in the Sarazdi paper, which was for men who had had the seed implantation and were technically disease-free, you'll see that most of them were a low Gleason score and a low stage. He uh, 
I've used external, the gel application for the um, testosterone replacement, although I think a couple people got the shots. Um, and you can see that the testosterone levels did increase uh, when patients were on testosterone replacement. And here's the range. I think if you've heard Dr. Leibowitz talk, uh, he's very interested in how high testosterone gets as a function of how well people do. And with a median follow-up of close to five years, uh, the men were doing very well. The majority of them, 74%, had undetectable PSA, despite having a prostate gland in place with those seeds that were implanted. And all of them had a PSA of less than one. So it's a pretty compelling experience. This is the paper with Bob Leibowitz that looked at 96 patients. So it's one of the larger experiences, but it's a very heterogeneous group. So the most interesting thing about our paper, I think, is that these men were largely metastatic, advanced disease, so they had high PSAs. Uh, everyone else, all those other series, they had PSAs of zero to get on the study, and here people were getting testosterone with PSAs over 20, so clearly active disease. Uh, there were men, 12% had distant metastases, and there was a larger percentage of high grade. The men who were treated definitively with surgery or radiation who were on this study had recurred and been treated with hormones for micrometastatic or macrometastatic disease and were still given testosterone replacement. So it's very different than the other series. And what we found was that most people did not do well, but there was a small group of patients who did. About a third of men for three years could be on testosterone replacement without their PSA rising significantly and without any signs that the disease was progressing. Most of them, 60%, did stop due to PSA rising um, but some of them came off just because they got tired of doing the gel or they didn't feel that it was helping them that much. And then we looked at, out of those 96 patients, who were that one-third who did very, very well? And they tended to be the ones with lower PSA at the time of starting testosterone replacement. Uh, and having a, had a prostatectomy, because when your prostate gland is in place and you add testosterone, you more commonly get a rise in PSA and then keeping the DHT low during treatment. So I'm a big proponent of men who get testosterone should probably get a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor with it. And then, uh, as per Dr. Leibowitz's theory, the higher the testosterone, the better they did. So we also took a look at, did men benefit? And the answer is overwhelmingly yes. We didn't have full data for all the men. But the ones we did overwhelmingly said that they felt markedly better with testosterone. They felt like their life had been given back to them in some cases. So a big concern is that two-thirds of the men, the PSA goes up and they have to stop. And was that dangerous? Did their cancer then progress? Were they worse off for it? And this graph shows you it's not projecting terribly well. But the bars that go down, all these bars, are the PSA dropping as soon as you stop testosterone. So there were just a couple of guys where the PSA continued to go up despite removing the testosterone. And for them, they had to go on and get more therapy. And a few of them did have either new symptoms or new spots on their scan. So this is something that is still to be undertaken very cautiously. A lot of people would still consider it to be taboo, and yet I think it's a big unmet need. There are a lot of men out there who have been cured of their prostate cancer, but who feel very ill because they don't have testosterone. So we're trying to get people who are interested in this concept together to start prospectively collecting data and find out the safest ways to do it. The other way to use testosterone, as I alluded to earlier, is for active prostate cancer, which seems totally counterintuitive. But when you look back at these old papers, 1947, they're talking about giving testosterone to men with prostate cancer. There were three patients in this study by Dr. Brenler uh, who were hopeless, terminal. And for at least one of them, he had a sort of Lazarus response. He felt much, much better. And in fact, when he stopped testosterone, uh, he felt worse again, and then they gave him testosterone again, and he felt better again. So it seemed to be really related to the testosterone treatment. And there was this other study from 1967 where they gave uh, testosterone to 10 men who were hormone refractory or castration resistant. Back then, they called it androgen independent. That's the AIPC. And one out of
of 10 of them again had this Lazarus response where he what had been protected was on his deathbed and the testosterone really helped him gain weight and feel better and uh, he lived another year. So there, despite the heretical nature of saying testosterone might have a role here, um, there, are, there is some evidence. And so uh, Walt Stadler from University of Chicago tried to run a study. He tried to take the safest group of men, uh, which is just PSA only, nothing on a scan, uh, who had become castration resistant. So your PSA is rising, you do scans, nothing there, you get Lupron, and at some point after going down, PSA starts to go up, but your scans still are negative. He figured that's a pretty safe population. If testosterone is going to make the disease progress, at least they don't already have overt metastases. So we participated in the study. And uh, unfortunately, the study had to be closed due to poor enrollment. So I think there's still a huge bias out there. People think they know the answer, and so they're not willing to take the risk. But I think um, we need your help. One of the things advocacy groups can really do is help promote clinical trials because we don't get new drugs or new ideas without doing a clinical trial. We have to show that it works, and we can't do that without the help of our patients. So this could have been a very interesting, very exciting new approach, and after the failure of this trial, it's unlikely that there will be another, although not impossible. I never give up hope. All right, so this now I'm going to talk about herbal, my herbal cocktail uh, trial, but before I do that, do, do people have questions about the testosterone projects? No, you've probably heard about it before. Do you find that there's any beginning of adherence in the urologic community to the concept of restoring? Or are they worried about litigation? Among urologists, I think it's like a dirty little secret. I think they do it and they just don't talk about it. Um, because I think most of uh, most urologists have probably had a patient or two where they did it and got away with it. Uh, and if we could just collect that experience prospectively, uh, then it wouldn't have to be done in secret. Um, but I, there are plenty of people who would never do it. There are plenty of people out there who are doing it. How, how exactly does it work? Larry, would you stand up so the people in the back can hear you? Well, I'm even when Dr. Bob was here, I just can't seem to get my arms around the concept as one who has deprived myself of testosterone and lower PSA, and then why is it okay to load up on testosterone and not have it affect prostate cancer? It's just two counterintuitive ideas that are, that are still in my mind I can't get resolved. Maybe it is counterintuitive to think that we focus so much on depriving your bodies of testosterone. How could it ever be okay? And the, the answer is we don't know. I mean, we have those very interesting data from Leonard Marx that suggests that maybe exogenous testosterone doesn't penetrate at the cellular level. I mean, if it's not getting into the prostate tissue measurably, if it's not turning genes on, then why would it promote cancer growth? The other way to wrap your head around it is to say, if I have no cancer in my body, I had surgery, I had radiation, I did whatever, I had hormone therapy for two years, my PSA is zero, then giving you testosterone should not induce a new cancer. So the only reason it would promote your cancer to grow is if there is cancer there. And I think most of us who would use testosterone try to use it only in patients who we think are free of disease other than this Walt Stadler trial, which was very, very avant-garde, pushing the envelope. Most people would not feel comfortable with it, which is why the trial couldn't be done. Well, let's do that just for a moment. Uh, Dr. Bob has been here several times, and he is an advocate of very high level testosterone. And he uses it even in patients who are failing chemo, who clearly have metastatic prostate cancer. I don't, I don't understand how that's for us with your last. So the question is, so he is, Dr. Bob is using testosterone in some men whose prostate cancer is metastatic and who are failing chemo. How does that square with this? Well, I don't know. I don't know how those patients do, and I don't have blood samples from them or molecular analysis to understand why. That's why we need to do these things on a clinical trial. Because then we can ask that question. Maybe their cells are no longer androgen receptor driven. 
although we know that the vast majority, even of castrate-resistant prostate cancer, is still being driven by androgen receptor, maybe the guys who do really well on this crazy testosterone program, there's something different about their cancer. But until we study them, we won't know. We'll never learn it. Okay. So the Prostate Health Cocktail is something that is commercially available. It was designed by my colleague Jacek Pinsky at USC. And we received funding from the Whittier Foundation to study it prospectively in a clinical trial. And we chose to study it in men with biochemical recurrence. This is probably one of the biggest groups of, of new patients that I see, uh, both because I have the trial and because it's just a common problem. You get your surgery or your radiation, you think you're cured, and at some point your PSA rises again. So there are thousands and thousands of men like that. And for them, the standard of care is observation. But it's really nerve-wracking to sit and watch your PSA go up month after month or every three months, however frequently you're checking it. And yet, we know that hormone therapy, while it's very effective and would make that PSA go right to zero, has a lot of side effects. And we don't know that giving it, when your PSA is rising, changes your, your life expectancy from the prostate cancer versus waiting. So we don't know if giving you hormone therapy when your PSA is 0 0.1 versus 1 versus 10 versus 100. We do not know. There's zero data about whether that changes how your cancer will ultimately progress. So if we don't know it's going to benefit you and we know there are harms, we try to avoid it. Now, I do use hormone therapy for men with biochemical recurrence who are high risk, who have a rapid doubling time or had very high risk features of their initial cancer, like a lymph node that was involved, and for some reason they didn't get hormone therapy. But the majority of men in this scenario are just watching their PSA go up. So we decided to test the supplement in this group. And as part of running the trial, FDA, uh, we had to get an IND from the FDA. They inspected the facility, so the content, the purity, the manufacturing processes were all documented like a pharmaceutical. And this is what's in the supplement. So there's vitamin D3. The reason that was chosen is because there had been a previous study that showed that you could make PSA go down in some men. Um, I probably would have put a bigger dose. Dr. Pinsky only put 400 IUs, and most of you are probably taking 1,000 or 2,000. Um, but this was his choice. Uh, he also put in vitamin E, which I'm not sure I would have selected, but there are certainly data that vitamin E interacts with the androgen receptor, so a reasonable choice. Selenium, which is famous now from the Selenium Prostate Cancer Prevention Trial, which unfortunately was negative, but these patients have prostate cancer, we're not preventing it, right, so it's a different Green tea extract, which has been shown to uh, suppress growth of prostate cancer cells in culture. And then saw palmetto, which we think works a bit like a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor. Can I interrupt just a minute? Our sound guy is here. Do you want him to hook up the doctor? Okay. I need the help with the back to make sure she can. Sorry about the interruption. Uh, and you're going to give me a mic, right? Yeah. So later on, if anybody has a question, we'll hand you a mic so that you don't have to stand up and turn around and preach to the audience here. Uh, we'll, we'll get it handled. Yeah. <laughs> Where's the coffee and donuts. <laughs> Sorry about the interruption, folks. Test your mind. Testing. Not yet. Testing. <coughs> Testing. No, it's not coming out yet. I, I think I hear one. You want to see the screen in Dr. Dorf more than me? What's up with that? <laughs> you know, we were doing quite well, I think, without it. We can continue on until he gets his operation going. So just go ahead and all of a sudden if it blasts out, well, we'll settle from there. Okay. Hopefully 
Hopefully I won't hurt anyone's ears if that happens. There we go. Oh, there you go. Just gave it. Give it. Is it gone? No, it's there. Wow, that's loud. It's loud for you, it's good for us. Okay, so I was talking about cell palmetto. It works a little bit like a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor, which reduces conversion of testosterone to DHT. Then there are soy isoflavonoids in the cocktail. Those have also been studied uh, individually in men with biochemical recurrence and shown to modulate PSA. And then lycopene, which I'm a big fan of. Lycopene is the cooked tomatoes thing. And there have actually been interesting studies uh, where they gave it to men before radical prostatectomy. And compared to placebo, they found a reduction in the rate of a positive surgical margin or leaving cancer behind, which is quite a profound impact considering that's the same impact that hormone therapy has prior to radical prostatectomy. So I'm a big fan of lycopene. So the clinical trial is now close to 40 patients, but when I presented the data in February, we had had to stop back around October, November to collect and analyze. So we're reporting just on 28. And you can see that uh, most of them are a low Gleason, less than seven. And uh, most of them had actually had both radiation and surgery. So they're um, somewhat heavily pretreated, so to speak. Uh, there's a wide range that's so not only for older gentlemen, uh, but the baseline PSA was pretty low. At first we uh, required a PSA of 2 to get on, but the men whose PSA was 0.8 and 1 and 1.2 didn't want to wait till they got to 2, so we lowered the entry criteria to 1. Uh, and then the doubling time we do restrict, because I personally believe if your doubling time is under 3 months, you really need hormone therapy. That's a very strong uh, risk factor for developing metastatic disease. So we allow doubling times from three months to 36 months, but on average it's been about seven months. So this is the waterfall plot. It may not be impressive when you compare it to the kinds of waterfall plots you see with hormone therapy or chemotherapy, but you have to remember this is an herbal cocktail. So these men have all had their PSAs go down. This line is a 30% reduction from baseline. And after these data were collected and analyzed, we've subsequently gotten some that have gone down by 50%. So we're pretty excited about that. These are all men whose PSA was going up, 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 up. So even these guys, where it just doesn't change, they're very happy. And the ones where it goes down are even happier. Um, the best part about it is the side effect profile. We haven't really seen much, by the way, of side effects. Uh, some people have a little bit of gas or stomach discomfort. That's probably from the green tea component. Uh, but most men say they feel the same, if not better, uh, unlike hormone therapy. And very importantly, we are measuring testosterone levels and dihydrotestosterone levels and are not seeing any changes. So this is not working estrogenically. It's not working hormonally. Uh, it's working through other mechanisms. Part of the study, one of the reasons we do clinical trials is to learn cool things, and we're using some very cool technology that was developed by USC in conjunction with Caltech, which is this uh, membrane filter to detect circulating tumor cells. So there's an FDA-approved assay currently, the Veridex Cell Search, that's uh, approved for metastatic castration-resistant prostate cancer patients. You can actually take a tube of blood and count how many cancer cells you find in there. Uh, but that technology, uh, can't capture as many cells uh, because of how it's selected, and I won't go into that in detail. But by using a simple micro pore, we're able to capture uh, the tumor cells with a greater efficiency. So it's about an 89% capture efficiency. And uh, there will soon be data presented from a, a large randomized trial in metastatic patients that I believe will show that this methodology is more sensitive and more effective than the existing technology. Uh, but for now, what's interesting in our herbal trial is that we could find that some of these men had circulating tumor cells. Why is that interesting? Well, that might help us risk stratify. If we detect circulating tumor cells, to me that's an indication that there's a, a fair amount of active cancer or that person is at a higher risk of developing metastases and I might put that person on hormone therapy earlier than a guy who doesn't have circulating tumor cells. And what's very interesting is other groups who have used the commercial technology, the cell search, uh, in a similar population found zero men with circulating tumor cells. So
So this is only a 5 out of the first 28. It's not tracking perfectly with PSA. Like, for instance, you have this guy that goes from 2 to 23. And his PSA actually went down initially, but then it went up, 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 and he came off and he developed metastases fairly early. So despite um, the fact that it's not tracking perfectly in our early experience, I do think it's something that's going to be very useful in the future. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about how hormone therapy works so that I can talk to you about new drugs. Um, I'm not sure if you've had speakers talk about the new drugs that are on the horizon, like MDV 3100. Not enough. Not enough? Okay, so to understand how we're getting these new drugs, I think it's always good to go back to the basics of how hormone therapy works. So if this is a cancer cell with a nucleus and you can't see my DNA scribbled in there, testosterone is floating around in the bloodstream. And the only way it can make your cancer grow is by using the androgen receptor to shuttle it into the nucleus and then activate genes that allow it to behave badly and turn off genes that would keep it under control. So, when we knock out your testosterone, I don't know if these red X's project, your cancer gets very hungry, it's very smart, and so the first thing it does is makes a whole lot of androgen receptor. And any of you who are my patients will probably recognize these drugs because I'm always scribbling this in, the, in my consultations. So, one thing we can do is blockade. We can prevent your testosterone from interacting with the androgen receptor, and that's what drugs like Casadex do by colutamide. And there are some older ones, flutamide and nilutamide. So they just set up a little barricade in the binding region of the androgen receptor so that testosterone cannot bind. But there are other ways. That's a very simplistic picture, right? There are other ways the androgen receptor can outsmart our hormone therapies. So this is from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a much more complicated diagram. Amplification, or increasing the copy number of androgen receptors, is only one route by which it escapes our hormone therapy. It can mutate so that it can bind other things. It can mutate so that it doesn't need to bind anything at all to move into the nucleus and activate the DNA. And um, we're learning that your cancer can produce its own testosterone also. So all of these developments, when we study the biology, that's how we learn things that help us design new drugs. So MDB 3100, which has finally been given a name, enzalutamide, is an androgen receptor blocker. It was designed by Charles Sawyers, who spent five years looking at why Casadex fails and trying to make a better androgen receptor binder. So this drug not only blockades the binding pocket of the androgen receptor, but theoretically prevents it from moving into the nucleus, regardless of whether something's bound or not. So a more complete silencing of androgen receptor. And uh, it was shown in a large randomized controlled trial to have a survival advantage after uh, docetaxel chemotherapy. It was about a 4.8 month survival advantage, which may not sound like a lot, but that's more than what we get from chemo and it's really well tolerated. I have a ton of patients who've gotten this medicine. Uh, we ran the trials both post-chemo and pre-chemo, and some of my pre, uh, actually some of my post-chemo patients are even still on it, as well as some of my pre. Some of them have had a year, a year and a half of zero PSA and feeling very good. It's similar to Casadex, doesn't have a lot of side effects. The biggest concern people initially had was seizures because in the early phase one and two dose finding studies, when they escalated the dose higher, they saw a few seizures. Uh, so for the phase three trials, which are the registration trials that lead to FDA approval, they backed off and chose a lower dose. And with that lower dose, they only saw 0.8% seizures. And this trial was probably about 1,200 patients. It was a big trial. So uh, that is already being filed with FDA, and we were anticipating approval probably by the end of this year, which is great news. For those of you who couldn't wait till the end of the year, which unfortunately I've had some patients in that situation, there is a compassionate access protocol that's opening. So it's a clinical trial, but there's no placebo, there's no randomization. They're just trying to get access to men uh, access for men to this drug because they know that this drug can prolong survival. So we will be having the compassionate protocol at USC and I'm sure there will be a site down in Orange County as well. It's very uh, non-restrictive. Unlike the abiraterone compassionate trials, which were a nightmare, this one, they're opening two separate ones. One is for post-chemo and one is pre-chemo. I don't know how FDA is 
letting them get away with that. But, um, and they don't restrict prior ketoconazole or prior abiraterone, so they're very inclusive. So I think most people should be able to get on. In the registrational trials, they didn't let you on if you were taking insulin because of uh, lowering the seizure threshold. They really did not want seizures on the trial um, and any other sort of seizure risk history. Uh, but I don't yet know on the compassionate protocol whether they'll allow insulin. So abiraterone got approved last year, about a year ago, May or June was the approval. So that one is more like an older drug called ketoconazole. So we know that when you get your Lupron or your Zolodex or your um, Degarelix or whatever you're getting, that shuts down your testicular production of testosterone, but it doesn't get you to zero, and that's because your adrenal glands still make testosterone. And also, we're learning, the cancer itself makes testosterone. So they designed these drugs that inhibit an enzyme called CYP17, which is necessary for the conversion of cholesterol into androgens, such as testosterone. Uh, so ketoconazole does this, but it's pretty tough. If any of you have been on ketoconazole, you know there can be a lot of side effects. Abiraterone is much cleaner. It has fewer side effects. It does require steroids with it, so you have to be on prednisone that reduces the side effects and improves the effect. Uh, but it's really much, much better than ketoconazole, much more effective. Um, so the, the randomized clinical trial post-chemo, post-taxotier, showed a, like a three and a half or four month survival advantage. And really exciting, the phase three trial before chemo, because most of us would choose a hormone pill over chemo, right? That trial was finally, um, announced only in a press release, so we don't have all the details, but they announced that it is a positive trial. So there's a survival benefit for using abiraterone before chemotherapy. And fortunately in California, even before that was announced, uh, Medicare and our other insurers have been paying for it. I have a lot of patients who are getting it commercially through their insurance who have never had Taxotere. I think most insurance companies uh, recognize that uh, most men would prefer to delay chemotherapy, and uh, it may be cost effective because it has a much better side effect profile than chemotherapy. Uh, that is, so as great as it is, some of my patients have been a bit disappointed uh, because it was so hyped and it was such a wonder drug, and then it doesn't work forever, but nothing we have works forever. So you go on it, your PSA goes down, and at some point, PSA goes up again. So it's not a cure, uh, but it is a nice tool, and I think it buys people some time away from chemo, uh, whereas before we didn't have something nearly as effective to accomplish that. So ARN 509 is something you may have heard less about. It's going to be like MDV 3100, but they're claiming it's going to be even better because of where MDV binds, where Casadex binds, where all the older antigen receptor blockers bind, uh, then the antigen receptor can mutate and not have that binding area. So then those drugs will be ineffective. So those are called splice variants of the antigen receptor. So this drug is supposed to silence it even when it has that mutation. So that's in about phase two trials right now. And then TAC700 is a sort of me too for abiraterone. It's a CYP17 inhibitor. Uh, it's now in phase three. So it's shown similar efficacy to abiraterone. The nice thing about it is you might be able to get away without the prednisone. So a lot of you who have been on prednisone know that the prednisone has some unpleasant side effects. Uh, and so getting away without prednisone would be nice. We got a new chemo drug in the last couple years also, cabazitaxel. Uh, this, I think people have been a little less excited about. It does work for some people, but it is chemo and it's a tough chemo. Initially, I was very reluctant to use it. When they uh, discussed all the findings from the clinical trial, there had been some deaths, which is obviously unacceptable. Um, but it turns out they were all from one center in Yugoslavia. It, it was, uh, Eastern European country where they weren't using growth factor support. So they didn't use Neulasta or Neupogen to support the immune system. So the experience in the United States since the drug was launched is that it is actually very safe if you dose it appropriately and use growth factor support. 
So 100% of my patients who get cabazitaxel also get an injection to support their immune system. Um, and if you or your doctor ever has a question, I'm happy to discuss dosing because I think most of us are not starting at the FDA approved dose. Most of us are starting a bit lower for safety reasons. Um, so we did a phase two study at USC of these other two chemo drugs, Olympta and Oxaliplatin. Olympta is approved for lung cancer and for mesothelioma, and Oxaliplatin is used for colon cancer. So we looked at the effect profiles and the side effect profiles and decided that it would be nice to put these two in combination. And we treated about 47 patients. Hopefully the data will be published soon. Uh, and we found that it worked very well and was actually pretty well tolerated. You would think two chemo drugs might be very hard, uh, but these men had all been through Taxotere, a lot of them had been through Mitoxantrone, and yet some of them were able to stay on this treatment for close to a year uh, with good results and not too much, by the way, of side effects. Uh, certainly not for every person, um, but we're sort of deciding now what is the next step. Do we compare it against Mitoxantrone? Do we compare it against cabazitaxel? Uh, so we're still deciding on uh, whether this will move forward. There's a lot less enthusiasm for chemo these days, which is part of why we're having trouble getting the manuscript published, because everyone says, well, you have Abiratero and you don't need chemo. But there are still guys, I have some guys, especially some young guys, 50, 55, who've been through all the chemo and all the hormones that you can possibly come up with, and they still need new options. So we also have a trial of this drug, AN152. This is a very cool drug. It's like a smart bomb. You take LHRH, which is the target of drugs like Lupron, and uh, they're only found, LHRH receptors are only found on prostate cancer cells and your pituitary. They're not found anywhere else in the body. So what, what they've done is linked a chemo to LHRH so that the chemo will be delivered only to cells theoretically, that express the LHRH receptor. So you're trying to target your chemo. Uh, so this has been used already in women, in women's cancers that express LHRH successfully. And we are finishing up the phase one because we wanted to confirm the dose for men with prostate cancer. Turns out that the dose they use for women is a little bit too much for men who have been through Taxotere, so we're backing off and expanding the lower dose cohort. Uh, but we are seeing some nice responses and it'll be opening up into a phase two trial soon. Have you guys heard talks on Provenge? Should I skip this? You've heard talks on Provenge? Okay, good, so we'll skip that. Have you heard about ipilimumab? Not so much. So ipi is a, a very promising drug, but it's, it's tough. Um, it is a much more potent immune therapy than Provenge. So in melanoma, where almost nothing else works, it was shown to prolong survival and so got FDA approved. But in running the melanoma trials, which was happening at USC while I was a fellow there, patients got sick because what this drug does is it turns off the brakes on your immune system. So imagine driving in your car without brakes, right? You can't really control where you go. And that's what happens with the immune system. So it might attack the cancer, but it might also attack your liver or your colon or your pituitary gland. So patients could get very sick, um, but once they learned about the side effect profile, the autoimmune side effects, they were able to develop some ways of managing it that make it safer to use. And it can make your tumor disappear. It put patients in total remission for many, many years, which was really exciting. Because most things like abiraterone, right? PSA goes down, then starts coming up again. You kind of want to get off that roller coaster. You want something that just makes the cancer go away and stay away. So that's where immune therapy, I think, holds great promise. It doesn't work for a large percentage, so it might not work for most people, but the people where it works can have a really prolonged remission. I don't remember if I put, um, uh, so this, these are data from the ipilimumab trial that um, I participated in when I was in Santa Monica in prep practice, where we gave a dose of radiation. So we were trying to get some control of our immune system with no breaks by zapping a spot that had metastatic prostate cancer so that your dying cancer would release some proteins and then waking up your immune system and hoping that that would help it 
attack the prostate cancer more than other parts of your body. So it's a very interesting concept. And uh, this is, again, a waterfall plot showing you start out here. These are the people whose PSA is going down. And these are people whose PSA is going up. So obviously, it doesn't work for everyone. But there are some people who got down to zero. And uh, I don't think I put the slide in. We saw tumors shrink down to nothing. We saw people stay in remission for uh, at least 52 weeks. And I haven't been privy to the longer term follow up on that study. So that's the promise of immune therapy. All right. Have you heard of XL184? Yes. You yes, have? Yes, we've heard of it, but we want you to explain it a little more detail. <laughs> yes. Okay. I just don't want to bore you. Um, XL184 is um, still a bit of an unknown quantity. So uh, last year, there was just some poster. It wasn't even an oral presentation. And you'd walk by and you'd see these bone scans going from lots of cancer to no cancer. And we just do not see that. Taxotere doesn't do that. Hormone therapy doesn't do that. We thought, well, what is this? So then there was a concern. This happened in the majority of patients on the early phase trial. Uh, there was a concern whether it just interferes with how a bone scan is supposed to be read, that this is artifact. So last year, we finally got a talk. Uh, Maha Hussein presented a little more data from the trial. And it looks like your PSA doesn't change. So that was part of why people were suspicious about these bone scan changes. But pain, cancer-related bone pain, did go away in these men whose bone scans went from hot to cold, which suggests it's more than artifact. So we're pretty excited about it. It's not currently available widely. There is a phase three trial, uh, but I've been sending my patients who need this drug out to Nevada to get it. I do think they have it in San Francisco open and running now. And we've been trying really hard to get it at USC because we think it's an exciting drug. It is non-hormone, it is non-chemo. It is just a new targeted therapy that works on androgenic pathways and this protein called CMET. So the one concern I have is the guys I've sent away to go on this trial, they do get pretty sick. So it, the VEGF inhibition is sort of similar to Sutent, which is a drug we use for kidney cancer. And if you ever talk to a patient with kidney cancer who's been on Sutent, they'll tell you it really knocks you down. And that's what I've seen in my patients who go on the XL184. So, like I said, it's still a bit of an unknown quantity. We're really excited about it, but we still have to learn a bit more about it. And then hopefully you've heard about denosumab. That's the new shot that we can use to support your bone strength and to reduce your risk of fractures uh, rather than using the IV. Um, and then desatinib is this sleeper drug. It's approved for a form of leukemia. And it seems to interact particularly with bone cells uh, and signaling, which would make sense for prostate cancer since there's such heavy involvement of the bone. And they've done some phase two trials, and there's been some signal of efficacy, but it hasn't quite made a splash. So we are going to be testing it in combination with abiraterone. Uh, because there's some uh, laboratory data that suggests that when you're suppressing androgen receptor, that the target of desatinib, this SARC, uh, this, this uh, family of kinases, is sort of an escape route. So we, we propose that hitting them both at the same time might increase the duration of response to abiraterone compared to giving it alone. So that trial should be opening very soon. Um, so do people want to hear about fasting, or do you want to go to questions? Raise your hand if you're interested in fasting. We want to do both. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. I'm so excited that you're interested in fasting. It's my little pet project. Uh, it derives from some laboratory work done by Walter Longo at the School of Gerontology. So it turns out if you don't eat much during your life, you're going to live longer. Uh, so calorie restriction is associated with uh, Lack of aging, lack of developing cancer, it's really good for you not to eat, which sucks because most of us really like to eat. Um, but he took that concept and said, what, what is it doing? It must protect our bodies. And who needs more protection than someone who's getting chemotherapy? Because chemotherapy really destroys your body. It's toxic. So he took mice with cancers and either had them eat normally and gave them high-dose chemotherapy, 
or he had them fast, zero calories, but as much water as they wanted for 48 hours before the high dose chemotherapy. And I wish I had put the slides in because the, what happened to the mice is so dramatic. The ones who got the high dose chemo and had been eating normally died. They just, the toxicity was overwhelming because he gave a very high dose. The mice who had fasted actually thrived. They had lost weight leading up to their chemo, but immediately after chemo, they didn't show any of the signs of feeling lousy and not wanting to eat. They just ran around and ate, gained back their weight, and they lived. So it was a very dramatic protection against the toxicity. So based on that, people started doing it around the country and, and calling us up and writing into us about their experience, and we put together a series of about 10 patients, and we published it. Patients, including prostate cancer patients, who would fast for 72 hours, someone even for 120 hours, and they wrote into us about the kinds of side effects they had from their chemo, and a lot of them were saying they were on chemo before, and they had so many side effects, and then they started fasting, and they did so much better. So very anecdotal, very non-scientific, but interesting. So we uh, got funding to run a clinical trial where we are escalating fasting instead of a new pharmaceutical prior to chemotherapy to prove whether it's safe and feasible in cancer patients because you know, my, my laboratory colleague is like, oh, just make them not eat. But he works with mice. You can just take away the food. You can hide it. Right? People, it's a little trickier. And so we had to nuance it a little bit and say, okay, if you're feeling really bad, you can go ahead and eat, but try to stay under a certain calorie amount and try to avoid certain foods. Uh, but so we started out with 24 hours and we had, so these are confidential. These can't be published until we present these data. So hopefully the video is not going to be published anywhere for a while. Um, the first six patients did 24 hours and they did fine. Most people can go without food for 24 hours as long as they're drinking water. Then we went to 48 hours. That was tougher. Some people started eating a cookie here and there just to make it through. Um, and then we went to 72. And that's been really challenging. I have to say, most people might be game to try 24 or 48 hours. Most people say, I can't do 72. But I have some wonderful, wonderful patients who have done it. And uh, they've gotten it down to a science what you can eat and stay under 200 calories in a day. Um, so we're about to finish that up, and if it looks like that is safe and feasible, we will then do a randomized trial. That's the only way you can really answer the question, are they having fewer side effects? Because you don't know, the people you pick maybe wouldn't have had side effects anyway, or would have had excessive, right? So you have to randomize to account for all these other unknown factors. Uh, but we're going to randomly assign people to either eat their normal diet or fast. So uh, maybe if I come back in a year or two, I'll have an update on those data. Uh, but it's been very, very uh, provocative. I was interviewed by a French documentary filmmaker about my fasting trial, and I've spoken to the BBC. They're going to come film next month. South Korean public broadcasting system is coming. I mean, people are just really interested because Imagine, instead of a very expensive $5,000 drug that you could take to avoid side effects, this is free. So this can be done anywhere in the world. It can be done in an underdeveloped na nation where they don't have a lot of resources. Uh, and it's broadly applicable because chemo just does oxidative damage. And if fasting protects against chemo X, it seems to protect against chemo Y. So it could be applicable to lots of different cancers and lots of different chemos. So our next step, because of this experience we've had where people said, I can't do 72 hours, we, uh, well, Walter really, has designed a special diet. So a lot of people have done fad diets where they drink only lemon and pickle and whatever in a bottle for three days. So people seem to be willing to do that. So he's going to uh, put everything that you can consume in a box. So you'll have a soup packet and a drink, and he'll tell you exactly what to consume when. And there will be some calories, but still very, very low. And so we're going to test that in prostate cancer patients who are receiving Taxotere, as well as breast cancer patients receiving their chemo. Uh, so that has um, already cleared IRB, and we should be up and running with that shortly. All right. Questions? Oh, okay, wait, wait. Can you continue, can you continue with this over a six-month or nine-month period? You're on chemo? 
So that's a good question. Our trial can't answer how long it's safe to do it. Our patients have only done it for two chemo cycles. Some of the people who wrote in to us and we collected their experience did it for longer, but I don't know that anyone's gone six or nine months. Um, but it's, it's three days out of 21. Um, I think that it would probably be safe. People don't seem to lose that much weight and they seem to be able to gain it right back after the chemo. Yeah, I think one of the things that we're missing here is you mentioned three days out of 21, and you mentioned doing three days, but we don't know exactly what you mean by three days. Is it three days out of 21? Is that the formula? It's one? two days leading up to your chemo, and then the day of your chemo, so to speak, 24 hours after your chemo infusion finishes, is the highest amount of fasting that we are testing. Okay. So you only do it around the time of your chemo. The idea is this. When you fast, when there's an absence of nutrients, your body undertakes big changes. It doesn't, the cells don't divide. They upregulate all these protective things because it's stress and your body doesn't like it and you, your cells recognize that signal. But a cancer cell is so dysregulated that it just goes right on dividing. And so we think it may actually increase the susceptibility of your cancer cells to the chemotherapy in addition to protecting you because uh, you just the, the cancer cells just don't care. They're too abnormal. Uh, but so it's, it's time right around chemotherapy uh, so that it's supposed to help your body resist the damages of chemo. Okay, now when you go off this three-day fast, do you go on your regular diet or do you recommend that they go on a reduced calorie diet? So that's a good question. To me, I feel like oh, they've done enough, like let them eat now, but Walter is really um, adamant that you don't want to jump right into you know, steak and potatoes. And one of my patients did find that during the trial. Like the first time she did it, she kind of jumped right back into this solid, solid food too quickly. So he does recommend that you start with maybe liquids or something milder and then go back to normal. But I, we're still working all this out. If anybody's ever done any fasting, you'll know that if you come off of it, you have such a tremendous urge to eat that you will definitely overeat unless there's some control factors that uh, your doctor puts you on some regimen. Because fasting, and then go off fasting, <laughs> I'm in heaven, bring on the chow. Any other, yeah. Um, back to XL184 for a moment. So my doc, I was asking my doctor about this. He said that it operates on a something similar to an anti-angiogenic and a uh, process. And, and how does that? Where does the pain or the shock or the that you are reporting? How, how does that? Uh, I mean, I've been on anti-angiogenics, you know, as kind of a maintenance, and um, I haven't had a big reaction to them like you're describing. Have you had Sutent? No. Yeah, so there's anti-angiogenic and there's anti-angiogenic. Um, for kidney cancer, those are the, that's where anti-angiogenic drugs were primarily developed, and Avastin, which is the IV antibody, my patients feel pretty normal. I don't know what it is about Sutent, but it's it's the oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor form of an anti-angiogenic, and this drug seems to be a little bit similar. We don't exactly know why people get so fatigued or why they get diarrhea from an anti-angiogenic. It can be some of the off-target effects, so none of these purely only attack VEGF the way maybe Avastin does, so maybe that's part of why there are more side effects, is they're hitting some other kinase, um, but it's not really well known. They can cause hypothyroidism, they can cause decreases in your heart muscle strength, that can certainly contribute to feeling ill, but there are people who just feel lousy even in the absence of those other side effects. Since we're on the subject of XL184, you mentioned that it doesn't reduce PSA. I think I'm correct in quoting you that way. Uh, but it does reduce the bone pain and it makes the scans look wonderful. Uh, is it follow the test? Does it uh, affect survival? So that's what they're testing in phase three. A phase one and a phase two can't tell us that. 
but of course survival will be the ultimate end point. But uh, it, it can lower PSA, it's not that it never does, but it, not in the majority. So these bone scans that were going cold were sometimes in people where the PSA was not going down, uh, and that just made everyone a little bit suspicious. Uh, did you have a study comparing all those that brought in the androgen receptor? Uh, how about Afrodite compared to the others? What's the pro and con uh, as far as benefit and side effect? So Avodart does not uh, suppress testosterone. All it does is block the conversion of testosterone to dihydrotestosterone. So there's still testosterone, and so the side effects are much milder. The only place where Avidar has been studied, so it, it got FDA approved for benign prostatic hypertrophy, same place where finasteride or Proscar is approved, and then they studied it in men on active surveillance. So they took men with very low risk prostate cancer and randomly assigned them to Avidar or placebo and followed them for seven years and looked at whose cancer progressed. And they found a 25% reduction in cancer progression. So I do think it has some anti-cancer effect. There's been a lot of work done in Seattle looking at the genes and how they change after exposure to Avidart. And the genes you would want to turn off in a cancer, the Avidart does seem to turn a lot of those genes off. Uh, so I think there's a biologic reason to believe it has anti-cancer activity. I think the active surveillance trial gives us further evidence but it has not been studied as much in active prostate cancer, metastatic prostate cancer. They have looked at combining Cazodex with finasteride, Proscar, and they call that peripheral androgen blockade because you still have testosterone. It's just that we're barricading at the level of the cell and preventing it from being converted to the more potent dihydrotestosterone. But that has been shown to not be as effective against cancer as using the absence of testosterone methods. Well, uh, I just say in my, in my case, when I receive Rubron, yes, it drops, but not as fast as when we had the Avodan. It's really a drop, like a waterfall. Yeah, it's interesting. I think a lot of us use Avodar and Proscar in the absence of data. Um, just to try something in a guy where we don't want to jump to chemo, for instance. But now that we're getting newer tools like abiraterone and enzalutamide, I think we'll probably have stronger things to use. But for you, if it works, that's great, because I, I think you would probably be able to tell everyone the side effects are fairly mild. Although the reason that urologists aren't prescribing it to prevent prostate cancer, which we know it can, uh, is reportedly because of sexual side effects. And that's including the drug of the testosterone, dehydrotestosterone, all the way down. Yeah. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, we got one right back here. I didn't think that you'd leave us without saying something.
So if your PSA is going up, but your circulating tumor cell count is, doing, is going down, you're going to do better than if your PSA is going down, but the tumor cells are going up. Now, if they're both going in the right direction, obviously that, that group does the best. I wanted to visit one thing that you are making. I think your herbal therapy, which you're talking about, is exciting. And that was the question of sometimes when you do something that's wonderful, and then you want to maybe do something else. Could you use the microphone, please? Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So here we go. Okay. On your herbal therapy, okay. If one has taken the herbal therapy, would that negate them from the opportunity at a later point, if something goes south, to be a part of some additional uh, tests, or possibly will it affect the, uh, the hormone therapy if one needs to step into that afterwards? No, I think that's a good question. In the era where there are so many promising drugs on clinical trials, um, you always want to keep all your options open. But no, the herbal therapy doesn't seem to close any doors. And in fact, most of you may have taken one component or another of it anyway. And no one even usually takes note of your supplements. So you won't be excluded from anything. I think one concern ethically about running this study was to make sure we weren't having guys do herbal therapy instead of hormone therapy when they really needed hormone therapy. But we tried to design it such that the more aggressive cases of uh, someone who could benefit from radiation, they were always steered towards that. And in fact, we allow men who have gotten hormone therapy on the trial. So let's say their PSA was rising four years ago and their doctor decided to give them hormone therapy and then their, their PSA went to zero, they stopped the hormone therapy, PSA is rising again with good testosterone and the man says, I don't want to do hormone therapy again. Uh, we are allowing those people on because as long as there's been an informed decision, uh, I think it is reasonable. And we're not the only ones doing this. Uh, UCLA ran the pomegranate study and City of Hope ran the mushroom study, so this is a popular thing to do uh, because what we don't want to do is give hormone therapy unnecessarily and cause harm, uh, but we are interested in finding other options. There's, there's anecdotal data about resveratrol, but no good prospective studies that I'm aware of. So it may be good, but we just don't know. Anybody else? Uh, one kind of academic question I have. Uh, on, back to circulating tumor cells. If you have zero, that's good, obviously. Right. If you have above five, that's bad. But I haven't been able to read anything about what's between zero and five. Yeah, there are not data. And when we develop a new biomarker, we will analyze it on a continuous scale, uh, but we will also look for a cut point. And there are pros and cons to either approach, uh, but the data that we are being given shows is the cut point is how you can effectively discriminate who's doing well versus who's not. Jeff, question, doctor. Um, presentation we put on your website? No, but I think you guys now have it. Uh, we generally uh, put these on our website, but due to Dr. Doris' request that we